So good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the Green Living Workshop in our lovely May session. Hopefully some of you got out to enjoy some sunshine here shortly after dinner. So the Green Living Workshop series takes place once a month with our next session happening on June 17th at 7 p.m. So for those of you who want to go bigger than your backyard rain barrel, the topic in June is white, uh, rainwater harvesting. So it should be a really good one. Um, so to get back to today's topic, birds, we have with us here today Greg Wagner. He is a wildlife biologist from the Foothills region. Greg is also an avid lover of birds and spends a lot of time spending or studying uh, bird species at Frank Lake. So today we're going to be taking questions throughout the presentation. I'm going to do about one after each slide-ish. Greg will prompt me as to when uh, we can ask for some questions. So and if time allows, we will take some questions as well at the end of the presentation. So you can click on the Q&A option on your screen and type in your question. We will do our best to get to all of them tonight. And any that uh, we cannot get to will be answered via email. And I never asked Greg that, and I hope that's okay. So we also have a door prize available for all attendees this evening. You will be contacted within a few days if you happen to be the winner. Now, before Greg gets started on his presentation, we are going to do a quick poll. Now, we're going to do this poll to find out what level of birders we have attending today. Um, so, once the poll pops up on your screen, please go ahead and answer, and I will let you all know the results in just a moment. All right, so it looks like we have a lot of, I'm going to call you intermediate birders, since none of you are sleeping with binoculars under your pillow. All right, so most people, Greg here, are looking, you know, they're looking at birds when they're on a walk or going for a bike ride, or they intentionally go to places to watch for birds. So that looks like our answer is great. So I think that's really good. All right, so Greg, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please go ahead and begin teaching us all about what we don't know about birds. Thanks, Jane. And I'd just like to pass on just getting this screen up tonight was a major collaboration between Jenny and myself. <laughs> so uh, thanks to Jenny for that. As um, Jenny stated, this is about the birds of the River Valley um, and along the Sheep River. So I want to present a list of birds um, that you could see taking walks along the River Valley in Okotoks over the next month. And I want to focus on species that breed in the area. The river valley in um, Okotoks is made up of riparian poplar forests. Um, they are dominated by balsam poplars as well as willows. They are um, dependent on flood establishment. So I know for people who live in southern Alberta along rivers, these flood events such as happened in 2013 are major detriments. But these riparian poplar forests cannot exist without major flood events. And uh, as a consequence, uh, because of water management activities, such as the establishments of dams, the Old Man River Dam, for example, and dams throughout Western North America, uh, these riparian poplar forests have been put at risk and have diminished greatly. Also, the introduction of salt, cedar, and rush and olive have caused competition and a lot further loss of uh, these riparian poplar forests. Um, this forest type contains amongst the highest density and diversity of birds of any habitat in North America and are valuable for both uh, migratory and breeding species. The reason they have such great densities is there's a high degree of structure. If you look at most studies on birds that examine um, why there are so many birds um, occurring in given habitats, it's based on structure. So in these old um, forest types, such as we have in Okotoks, um, the riparian poplar forests in town probably established during a major flood event in 1963, are getting to be 80 years old or so, but they have a lot of structure. So you have the old trees, the thick bark, um, a lot of them are becoming decrepit. There are a lot of cavities. There are extensive willow and shrub populations underneath them. So there's just a lot of different structures where birds can uh, occupy different niches, which accounts for the um, density and diversity of birds. Um, 
And uh, as a consequence, I think that if we were to walk through these forests over the next month, we'd see um, probably somewhere between um, 150 and, or I'm sorry, over the next year, we'd see somewhere between 150 to 200 species. So I just wanna go through a list of, of birds that we're gonna see, talk to you a little bit about them. Um, if you have questions, please ask at the end of uh, the species um, or at the end of the group. So what I'm gonna present right now is four or five slides on waterfowl, but please just jump in with any questions. The first species I want to talk about is the wood duck. Um, this is a species that's always been native to Alberta, but was much rarer um, years ago. Um, it has increased uh, dramatically along the South Saskatchewan River drainage. That includes the, the old man, the bow, and the red deer in recent years, maybe as a result of some introduction exper uh, exercises conducted by Fish and Game Association. The male, as you can see, is a beautiful bird and is touted as one of the most beautiful birds in the world. Um, these first three ducks, I'm gonna show you what's interesting about them is they are all cavity nesters and they nest in the cavities and trees. So they're very much dependent on these older, mature balsam poplar forests. Um, the next species is common goldeneye. And again, this one's very common along the river. Uh, the male is uh, the bird with a bright uh, white dot under its eye. The female is a little drabber. Um, and again, this is a species that nests commonly in holes and cavities in trees. Um, this is a species that you would see regularly along the river. And the final species um, of duck that I want to present is common merganser. Uh, and the male and female are shown in the top picture. Um, these are a fish eating bird and um, do extremely well at ponds in town where they introduce fish. You can always tell when the trout have been introduced to ponds in High River because you have a whole horde of uh, mergansers showing up to feed on them. At the bottom is um, a female with young. Um, I had quite an interesting experience with this species once. Um, I was doing some work at Fish Creek Park. We were releasing some prairie falcons there and we set up in blinds um, underneath some cliffs early in the morning. And at about five in the morning, um, sitting in this blind thinking I had the world to myself, I hear this sudden thud on top of the blind. And what it was was baby mergansers jumping out of the nest. Uh, but they certainly gave me a fright for a few seconds. Finally, this is another one that is rather interesting is Canada goose. And often people associate Canada geese with nesting on the ground. But um, increasingly in the riparian poplar forest now, you see them use old hawk and crow nests and they nest in trees. So um, Canada geese have really become sort of very dependent on uh, these forests as a, a nesting area. Um, so let's sort of, uh, well, I got one more slide on waterfall. Um, the other thing about the Sheep River, if we're just walking along it, um, at this time of the year, we could easily see 12, 15 species a day. Uh, a lot of those are species that nest on the ground and are more common around sloughs and lakes. And I've just listed four here, mallard, northern shoveler, blue-winged teal, and American widgeon. And we'd probably have a very good chance of seeing any one of these duck species if we went for a walk today. Um, and as I say, there's uh, about another dozen that uh, would be a high potential. Um, but they're not, as de they're not so dependent on um, riparian poplar forests as they are water. And that takes me into waterfall. Any questions? We don't have any questions yet. Feel free to continue. Okay. Um, the other thing I just want to point out with these ducks, uh, I think just looking at these ducks, you can see uh, just there's a diversity of sizes, shapes, and colors, and they really are spectacular looking birds. Um, this is a bird that uh, was introduced to North America, I believe in the 1920s, if I remember correctly, and it's the uh, ring necked pheasant. This bird is very pop, uh, very common in the riparian poplar forests, and you can hear the males cawing. Um, I had intended to put in some sound with this uh, slideshow, but uh, it became a little complicated. Um, but this is a bird that certainly is common um, along the river, and uh, if you spend enough time, you're going to see several of these uh, over the course of a month. Takes us to another group of bird, which are doves. And there's two species that uh, you're 
really likely to see. The first, the top one is the morning dove. That is a, a native species. Uh, it's a beautiful little uh, bird, a brown, tawny, a little pink in it, and it has this long straight tail. Um, and it's very common in the riparian poplar forest. More recently, I believe it first showed up in the province in 2002, is Eurasian collared dove. Uh, it spread from uh, places like Pakistan through Europe in the 1960s and made its way to the uh, Arctic Circle fairly quickly. It got introduced to North America through the Caribbean and uh, it has exploded rapidly. I think we had our first record in Nant in about 2006. In a river in Okotoks now, there's probably 100 pairs and it's a year-round resident. Um, but it's starting to show up in the riparian poplar forest. Um, when people talk about game birds, um, and they always talk about ducks and such, but the most uh, popular game bird or the, the one where it's hunted the most and records the most um, uh, kills, I guess, is the morning dove. So it's a great value to hunters. What we've seen, however, is a hybridization between these two species and it's yet to see what the outcome of that might be, but I think you might hear more about that in years to come. As you can see also, the Eurasian collar dove has this black ring around its neck, and many of you probably see it in your neighborhoods right now. The other species of pigeon or dove we have is rock pigeon, and this is a common sort of park pigeon that you see. Um, you'll see it uh, quite frequently along rivers because they will nest under train bridges, road bridges, uh, and structures along rivers. So um, that's just a common variety pigeon. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. So that takes us to the pigeons, doves, any questions? No questions yet, go ahead. Okay. The next group of birds is shorebirds. And these are birds that um, occupy the shores along rivers uh, and lakes and such. And there are two species that are um, particularly common along rivers uh, in southern Alberta. The first is the killdeer, um, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with, uh, the prominent killdeer call. Um, they nest on the ground in gravel or sand. And uh, if you watch them closely enough, you can often um, watch them as they run to the nest. They'll also do great distraction displays if you get too close and try to lure you away from a nest. The second species, which is probably as common, if not more common, um, is the spotted sandpiper. Again, it occurs mostly along uh, rocky um, uh, river shorelines, uh, pebbly sort of shorelines. Um, it's a little smaller than a, a killdeer uh, with a spotted breast, as you can see in the picture. Um, and they're kind of neat. If you watch them when they walk, they sort of bob up and down all the time. Very busy bird. And like the killdeer, they also nest in the uh, gravels and usually have clutches of four to five uh, eggs. Um, another bird that's very common, um, and you hear it more than you see it, is the Wilson snipe. And the Wilson snipe, you can hear flying overhead, and they make this sound. And everything is call, but in fact, it's not. It's a noise made uh, as the, the wind or the air rushes through its tail feathers as it makes a, de uh, a descent through the air very quickly. Um, but you can hear them uh, quite commonly if we were to walk on the, along the river valley right now, I'm sure we would hear the calls dozens and dozens of time. Uh, they tend to uh, like sort of marshy areas, backwater areas along the creeks. And um, uh, another very, very common bird that uh, we get uh, in, high, in uh, Okotoks. In terms of migratory shorebirds, there's um, probably another 25 or so species that are actually moving through Alberta right now. And you'll find them along the lakes, uh, um, shores, of, uh, the shores of lakes and rivers. Um, the one that I'm going to feature here, because it's more likely to be found along um, a river, is the lesser yellow legs. It's also got a bigger river. Greg, you've just cut out for a moment. Relative a greater yellow. Okay. Um, 
There you're back. Okay, in terms of, of shorebirds, we also have a number of species that migrate through Alberta. Uh, right now, there's probably 25 or so species that would occur along um, the shorelines of rivers and lakes, more so lakes and sloughs than rivers. So I'm not going to feature a whole bunch of them, but the one that um, you would probably find along the shoreline in uh, Okotoks right now is uh, lesser yellow legs, and it has a relative, the greater yellow legs, which is very similar, just much bigger. Um, I see that we might have some questions. We do. Um, so one of our questions, and you may have answered this, uh, Barb was wondering um, which of these birds are migratory or not, and it sounds like you've, you've covered that, but maybe with regard to uh, some of the different duck species, or how many of those will stick around during the winter? Um, it depends on where you are. For example, there's some open water at Frank Lake. There's open water along um, the Highwood and Sheep Rivers, and in Calgary there's open water. Um, so every year, um, some ducks will overwinter. Certainly the mallards, the golden eyes, and the common mergansers commonly overwinter. Um, but I would say that all of the, well, I know that all of the duck species that I presented there um, will overwinter. In terms of migratory, most of the birds I'm showing to you are, they migrate up. So like the killdares and the spotted sandpipers, will migrate um, from the south and then back south. Um, and the reason I'm making a differentiation between a lesser yellow legs is that it does not breed here, whereas the killdeer and the spotted sandpiper would stop. So most of the birds uh, I've shown you, with the exception of the Eurasian collar dove, which is a year-round resident, the mallards, Canada geese, golden eye, and common merganser uh, will overwinter, but most of the populations migrate south. Does that answer the question? I think that's pretty good. Um, we also had two questions about uh, the Wilson snipe. Someone is wondering how long the beak of the Wilson's snipe is, and another person is wondering if they breed here or if they migrate through. This bill is about two inches long, and um, snipes are migratory, so they migrate here to breed. And the distinction I'm making between breeding and migratory birds is that um, the snipes stop here to breed, but they, they travel much further north as well. Um, so they are migratory. Some will overwinter, but not that many. Um, I hope that addresses the, the question. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. And that's all we got, so continue on. Want, okay, um, good now. Um, the next group I want to talk about are gulls. Um, and there's um, three species that breed in the area. All of them uh, breed in large colonies, um, and two of those breed at Frank Lake. Um, the first um, shot I'm showing you is of Franklin's gull. Um, it will breed in numbers up to 50,000 pairs at Frank Lake. It also breeds uh, large numbers at Red Deer Lake and Blizzard Lake. And in fact, those uh, three lakes may um, work in concert in that in one year, if the conditions aren't great at Frank Lake, they might be great at Blizzard Lake, so the birds go there. Um, and this is a bird that you'll see right now following tractors, but it's uh, as they're planting crops and disrupting all the grubs and stuff in the ground. But you'll see it commonly along the, uh, uh, the river, uh, note the black head and the small red bill. The other two are white-headed gulls. Um, they look very similar. Um, and two of them here, California gulls. Um, there's an island at Frank Lake. It's a gravel island under a transmission tower. And there's about 250 pairs nests there on the uh, uh, island. As you can see, uh, it's got yellow legs. And it's got its yellow bill with a black and red at the end. The ring-billed gull is a little smaller. Again, yellow legs, and it's got a black ring. Um, for gull enthusiasts, and there's, gulls can be hard species to identify, especially in uh, juvenile plumages, but uh, noting uh, eye color and leg color and all sorts of things like that is the key to being a patient gull identifier. Um, Rainbow gulls also nest in islands at colonies. Um, and they also used to nest in Frank Lake in an island that's no longer there. Um, but both of these you'll see commonly 
uh, along the river and uh, McDonald's is another good place to see them. So we do have a couple of questions about that. Uh, where do Franklin gulls go during the winter? Uh, they head south and I'm sorry, I'm stumped specifically where they winter. Um, I would be guessing right now. I'm sorry, I, I should know that, but I don't. But they do, they, they head for their, much further south, California area, things like that, Texas. Cool. Um, and someone else is wondering where Frank Lake, where, sorry, where Frank Lake is. Frank Lake is 10 kilometers east of High River along Highway 23. And it's, um, it is an important bird area. Uh, it is a major um, site for nesting waterfowl and water birds, and a very popular destination. Um, Ducks Unlimited, uh, because of COVID-19, has uh, shut down access to its property on the lake, uh, but will be reopening on June 1st. Um, so it's, uh, it's really good. There's also a blind um, that's been established, frankly. Ducks Unlimited will probably board that up just to avoid um, people from preventing people from social, uh, not social distancing, distancing because the blind is very popular and there's a long boardwalk to get to it. Um, but that's where Frank Lake is. Someone is wondering, Frank Lake has the blind at the north end. Is there access on the south end of the lake? Yes, um, Frank Lake has uh, three basins and you can access uh, Basin 2 um, at south and you can access Basin 3 at the south as well. You can drive uh, along both of those areas um, and pull in. At Basin 3 right now, the, the lands there are fenced and belong to Ducks Unlimited, so they're off limit till June 1st. But along the south end of Basin 2, there's a road in there. And if people wanted to get out and walk, they would be more than welcome to do so. Great. That's all the questions we have for now. OK. Um, this is another bird, um, again, referencing Frank Lake. And the reason I'm referencing Frank Lake is because these birds aren't breeding, per se, in, in Okotoks. But they do uh, breed at Frank Lake. This bird um, has increased dramatically in numbers at Frank Lake. And unfortunately, uh, they, along with pelicans, have really increased in numbers at the lake uh, in recent years. And unfortunately, that is probably um, due to the uh, establishment of Prussian carp in Frank Lake. Uh, over the last few years, Prussian carp have uh, really taken over the fish fauna at Frank Lake and it's caused uh, major booms in populations of fish eating birds like cormorants, um, which I guess is good if you're a cormorant, but in terms of native fish populations, um, the establishment of that Prussian uh, carp in the South Saskatchewan River Basin has uh, destroyed native fish populations. Um, you will follow, commonly see these right now um, along the rivers uh, coming to feed. So they're kind of a cool bird to watch uh, eat. Again, um, fish eating entirely. Uh, in keeping with fish eating birds, this is another bird that you'll see um, hunting uh, along the river. I, in fact, the last time I gave a presentation to um, the town of Oktoks, we went for a brief walk. And although it was very windy, we did manage to see one great blue heron. Um, they're a fish eating bird. They're commonly associated with the shores of lakes and rivers. And you'll find them again if we went for a walk today. I'm sure we'd see several of them along the Sheep River. Um, most people are surprised to find out that they actually nest in trees. And we actually have a colony in High River. So most of the birds that you see um, in Okotoks uh, probably come from the, um, I think there's about 24 nests in the colony in High River right now, if memory serves me correctly. But that's what they do. Uh, they nest in trees like that, and they nest in balsam poplars. Um, there has been a decline over the last three decades in the number of colonies um, along the South Saskatchewan River Basin, but major colonies still exist in places like uh, High River, uh, Police Point Park, and Medicine Hat, and these repairing poplar uh, forests are sort of essential to the survival of the species in southern Alberta. The other heron that um, isn't as well known as the great blue heron, but it's just a beautiful bird. That bird's about, um, uh, about 16, 18 inches tall, 
It's a black crown night heron. And they're not as common um, as the great blue heron. And you may only see one or two or three of them per year um, along the river valley, but um, something to be on the lookout. It's just a, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. This is another species that people, uh, like I said, I, I, I was, my sort of aha moment was when I got a checklist when I was about 12 and it showed all the birds. It's a turkey vulture. Um, they have started to really expand the range in Alberta. Um, it, I didn't see one in High River or this area until about 10 years ago. And now uh, for the last four years, I've seen them along the Highwood River regularly and strongly suspect that they nest there. Um, they have um, been recorded nesting in old buildings and uh, you know if there's old abandoned shacks along the river they may well be in those. Um, so this is a bird to keep your eye out for, um, a large black bird with a red head. They also um, fly when they're, they're soaring or not flapping their wings they have a really interesting way they hold their wings. It's called a dihedral, where they hold their wings above the body in a V. So it's pretty distinctive to see, but um, these are uh, increasing in numbers, a very large bird and uh, just pretty cool to see. Another one, um, again, because of pesticides, it, this species was in decline for a lot of years, but it's made a remarkable recovery and now it's showing up all over the place as a breeding bird along rivers. And that's bald eagle. Um, they eat a variety of foods, but one in particular is fish. And um, I know we have a, a nesting pair in High River, and I'm sure it won't be too long before you have a, a pair in around um, uh, Okotoks. I know there's a pair in Turner Valley. There's several pairs in Calgary. Um, the other thing that's important about bald eagles in terms of these riparian poplar forests there was a uh, researcher from the University of Montana who followed these birds on migration. And you can actually end up having um, hundreds of birds fly into these riparian poplar forests at night and roost. And so it seems that these riparian poplar forests are an extremely important habitat for migra migrating uh, bald eagles as well. Uh, again, some birds stop to breed um, in, in High River, Okotoks area, um, others fly further north. This is a bird too that will occasionally overwinter uh, in the area. Um, so we do have a few people. questions, if that's sure. all right. Sure. Um, and I think you may have answered this one. Uh, someone asked, is the bald eagle resident in Alberta or does it migrate through? And I think you kind of answered that, but if you want yeah. to add to it. A lot of them do, but um, we do get bald eagles um, spending 12 months a year here. Certainly in Calgary, you can see them. Um, just because uh, you've got open water where they can fish, uh, they also eat a lot of carrion, so roadkill and that sort of thing. So again, the numbers are much less um, in the winter, but it's not unusual to see one in the winter, but the majority of them do migrate. Okay, and we have one more question just with regard to Frank Lake. Is it closed to people who want to canoe and take photos from their canoe? Um, <laughs> this is a question that comes up every year. And um, in terms of taking a canoe to Frank Lake, um, Frank Lake, um, you can certainly, there are no restrictions on using boats at Frank Lake. However, I'd like to make the two points. One, the unique thing about Frank Lake is it's, um, Water entering the lake is augmented by uh, treated sewage effluent from the Cargill plant in the towns of High River. So it, um, from that uh, potential, if you would like to go canoeing in um, sewage water, um, uh, I guess, be my guess. The other problem, um, and people should be well aware of the legislation under the Alberta Wildlife Act, the Migratory Bird Convention Act, and the Species at Risk Act is that disturbing um, nesting birds is a violation under those acts. Um, we really make an effort to um, ask people not to go near the reed beds at Frank Lake. There are many um, endangered and at risk species in there and many species whose only means of defense is to sit on the nest. For example, eared grebes, 
the only way they prevent um, predation of nests is to sit on a nest. If they are disturbed uh, in any way and leave the nest, um, people can cause huge damage uh, by canoeing through reed beds or near reed beds. So the answer to the question is that there's no reason they can't take a canoe on it, but um, as someone who um, has really worked on the conservation of Frank Lake, I would, I would ask you to really consider doing that, what, what you want to do if you take a canoe on the lake. And that's all the questions. Oh, we have one more. How large is the black heron? Black heron's about a foot and a half tall. Good. Um, a wingspan of about three feet. And that's all we have for questions right now. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, next. The other bird um, is the osprey. And I know you guys have uh, you know, pair nesting at Dog Park. They have taken readily to uh, artificial nest platforms like this. Um, we have established one in High River and the birds showed up about four years ago, five years ago now uh, to use it. I know Ginny and I have discussed this as maybe putting a platform in town to see if you can get them off a of dog park. This is another species that um, was really at risk uh, 30, 40 years ago because of pesticide use and has stormed back. So we're seeing them more and more. Um, Quite frankly, if you put up one or two poles in Okotoks, you would have them occupied by ospreys. I know I'm talking with the town about putting up another couple of poles in, uh, in High River for them. I know that they've tried to nest at Frank Lake and I think the nest failed, but a structure such as you see here on a pole that's about 30 to 70 feet tall does wonders. And um, you can see them flying along the river and fishing all the time. Um, there is an interesting dynamic between the bald eagle and the osprey and that the bald eagles will, uh, if, if you get them nesting too close, the bald eagles will come and pick on uh, ospreys and force them to drop their fish and uh, bald eagles will swoop down and get the fish themselves. But I think it's really cool to have this uh, a place, you know, in High River, have a pole like this. Um, they are really tolerant of sort of disturbance, not that you want a whole lot of disturbance under the nest, but you know, people can view them, take pictures of them, and uh, it's just kind of neat to see. And I'll just jump in. The town actually did erect a osprey nest pole, whatever, um, just across from the wastewater treatment plant. So they took down the one, not took down the one at Dog Stadium, but they are putting up measures to deter the osprey from nesting there, and they've set up some other nesting habitat for them. And I think, you know, that's, that's really cool. And um, it's just nice to have them around. So, and, and you know, in terms of disturbance, I, mean, I think you make the point quite validly that um, uh, the fact that they're nesting at Dog Stadium just indicates that they can tolerate a little disturbance. So it's kind of neat. Um, another hawk that commonly breeds uh, in the area is the red-tailed hawk. Uh, here's a nest, uh, also use poplar trees. Generally tend to nest high in the trees. As you can see the red tail on the uh, adult bird there. Um, this is one of the more common hawks in um, uh, Alberta. Um, again, migratory, although a lot of birds stop to breed here. Um, I've gone through sort of hawk species and falcons here. There are a number of species that we could get um, during migration here. What I'm showing you are the species that um, a little migratory stop and breed in the area. So these are just uh, the birds I'm showing you um, actually breed here. And I'm sure, you know, walking through the parks in uh, Red, um, Okotoks, we'd find uh, several nests of this species. So we do have one quick question about osprey. Um, how long is their wingspan? Uh, wingspan's about five and a half feet. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, this is a, a falcon, American kestrel. This is a male, very, very pretty bird. Um, this is um, about just probably one and a quarter, one and a third size of the robin. And um, they are particularly fond of the riparian poplar forests. Um, I spent a couple summers working in, in Fish Creek Park and we were trying to count the number of breeding pairs we had in there. And we had dozens of breeding pairs uh, along the rivers in the riparian poplar forest. This bird nests in cavities. And these old, uh, decrepit uh, 
uh, trees along the river are just filled with them and uh, really attract American kestrels. Unfortunately, this is one species for whatever reason is showing population declines, which may be tied to insect populations and climate change. But um, very beautiful bird. And uh, again, we'd probably see several walking through the park in, in Oak Dose. Next one we'll go through um, is owls. And this is a, this is one that we're all familiar with. It's a provincial bird, a uh, great horned owl. That picture right now with that young, maybe two or three weeks older, um, I know about uh, 10 nests right now where I can go and see adults on the um, nests. Um, I would hazard a guess that there's probably four or five pairs nesting in the riparian poplar forest in Okotoks right now, and the young are about to fledge. Um, they start to nest late February, early March. Um, there was one case in Calgary a few years ago where they probably started to nest at the end of December. Um, so the young are very much getting ready to leave the nest. Um, and this is just a very common bird. Um, one thing I will say about owls, and great horned owls um, are pretty uh, resilient to disturbance. Um, but a lot of uh, owls are very popular amongst photographers. Um, and not all, all owl species are um, as tolerant of disturbance as great horned owls. So if you are wanting to photograph owls, please you know, respect the birds. If it's cold, windy, raining, um, limit your time taking pictures at nests. Um, those can cause mortality amongst young birds and limit the amount of time adults are feeding, et cetera. So just be careful with them. We do have one question about the great horned owl. Do you know of any nests that are nearby here in Okotoks? Um, not offhand. I do know of uh, a couple around High River, okay. um, uh, but not. Uh, I'm sure there's hundreds around Okotoks. Yeah. I know that I know it's been reported that there are owl nests in the forest behind the library if anyone's interested in going and looking around there. Um, I've also spotted some not nests but owls uh, in the old McLeod Trail forest area as well if anyone's interested. And yeah and I apologize um, uh, I've had this conversation before is that uh, I'm taking my experiences from High River and extrapolating them more on Okotoks. Um, I've, I used to spend a lot of time in Okotoks, but not so much in recent years. Um, the one thing about owls, there's, there's two ways you can go identify them. And great horned owls, you can go at what's called owling, and you can listen for owls at night, and you can play tapes, and they will respond to them. And if you go out uh, at night um, two months ago, even now, um, and play great horned owl calls, you'll have them calling all night to you. Two other owls that um, you're going to have similar experiences with are the saw wet ear, a saw wet owl, and the long eared owl. The saw wet owl pictured there is a tiny bird. It's chubby, but it's no bigger than a robin, um, if people understand what I mean. And it nests in cavities. Uh, that's got a bird poking, an adult bird poking its head out of the cavity. I've heard uh, literally probably several hundred of these birds in my life, but I've only ever seen two. So they're hard to spot. But if we went out, um, I suppose now we'd probably get some birds calling, but if we had gone out a month or two earlier, we would have you know, probably been able to hear four or five along the river valley in, in Okotoks. Another one that also occurs in these riparian poplar forests is the long-eared owl, and again, uh, it wouldn't be as common as either the great horn or saw wet, but um, in some years, probably most years, we'd probably hear a long-eared owl calling in the river valley. Um, again, when I talk about taking pictures of owls, long-eared owls are very um, sought after by a lot of photographers. There was one that was seen in Calgary about two winters ago, and I think uh, the day after it was seen, it showed up at 150 uh, Facebook pages of people taking pictures of it. Um, these owls tend to be a little congratory. So again, um, don't spend a whole lot of time around them. You know, I know it's nice to get pictures and things like that, but just be aware that uh, a lot of disturbance can force these, these birds out of areas and things like that. So I, I, people just need to be aware of that. So. 
Uh, one of our participants just wanted to add that there used to be a great horn owl nest west of the bridge on South Ridge Drive. And yeah, and I'm sure there's lots of them. Um, the other thing with great horn owls, um, and we're actually, I'm trying to get a, a project started here um, <clears throat> for Frank Lake. They do not build, build their own nests. They're dependent on old crow's nests and things like that. So, um, you know, you're talking, the, the person talks about a, a nest where it used to be. If that nest blows down, the owls have to look for another one. And I, I know of a place um, I lived at for two summers in the Cypress Hills where there was a pair of owls, but there was no nest. So they kept the, the, the area around the farmyard, lots of trees, but no nests, uh, simply because they didn't want to give up that area, but um, they couldn't nest because of lack of them. So they really need to, they're dependent on other species to build nests for them. This is a, a neat bird um, that it really makes a, quite a racket along the river. And where you often um, see this is sitting on sweepers that hang out over the river. And this is a belted kingfisher. It is migratory, but in a lot of winters, you have some birds overwintering uh, along the rivers here. That's a male that's got that beautiful chestnut band. That would be um, just a little smaller than a crow. And they uh, feed extensively on fish and they nest in uh, cut banks along the river. Um, and Again, if we made several walks along the river in um, Okotoks, that is a bird we would definitely see. Very pretty bird too, just uh, really great and can be uh, at times very photogenic because they do like to sit on the uh, sweepers across the river. Next, we'll move to, to woodpeckers. Um, biologists are really famous, bird biologists, for uh, lumping species together and then separating them. So we have um, two species of sapsuckers that could occur in Okotoks, the red naped and yellow bellied. And if you look at those two, they look very similar. Um, they used to be called one species, the yellow bellied sapsucker. Um, and then we divided them into two or three species. But that's just what birders and bird biologists do. Um, these are very common in the summer um, in these riparian poplar forests. <clears throat> and one thing that gives them away is that when they uh, peck on trees, they very much sound like a telegraph and uh, it's very distinctive. So something to listen to and you'll hear it commonly in the forest. So those are sap suckers. I could go into field marks on them, but um, you can also look at your guides. They're very, very uh, similar in appearance. There are two very common woodpecker species. And for anybody who has a bird feeder or a suet feeder up at home, they're probably familiar with both of these. The downy woodpecker um, in the bottom corner um, is, would be about the size of a starling or a blackbird. It has a short bill that's less than the width of the head. Um, and in that case, it's a male because it has red on the back of its head. The hairy woodpecker is a little bit bigger, um, about the size of a robin. And if you look at its beak, its beak is about as long as its head. And that's very distinctive on it. Um, and these are very common. They're year-round residents in Okotoks. And um, we could see probably up to half a dozen of either of these species uh, going for a walk on any day um, in this, this spring. The other very common bird, and again, it's common at feeders in town, is the northern flicker. Um, a beautiful bird. Um, you can hear it also pecking on trees. They make a loud mew call. And um, I know Jenny and Arwak, you, you heard one that day when we were out walking, one of the few birds we saw. But um, a very common year-round resident um, in Okotoks and in these uh, riparian poplar forests. Now, I talk about biologists splitting species and then lumping them together. There used to be two species. One was the red shafted species, uh, red shafted flicker, and the other was the yellow shaft. And if you look at the top bird, it's got the red and the wing shafts, and you look at the bottom, it's got the yellow. Those uh, birds have brought the range together, they interbreed, and you have, uh, you can see both yellow shafted, red shafted, and intermediates between the two, um, any place you go now. 
Um, I can't remember, I think the red shafted used to be occur in the mountains and the, the yellow shafted was coming in from the east. I may have that backwards. It's been years ago since the, they were separate species. But that's a very common bird and very colorful, very easy to see, very easy to photograph. There's the next uh, group of birds. Um, again, there's about, um, I don't know, 10 species, eight species that would, of uh, flycatchers that would be migrating through the area. And there's four or five that are resident. One of them is a very sort of nondescript bird. If you look at that, it's greenish, grayish uh, bird, very nondescript. It's about the size of a sparrow. And it's uh, called a Western wood peewee. Um, it's very, you, know, you can identify it by sight, but you can identify it better by the call. It goes, peer, peer, peer. And you can hear that quite com commonly um, in your walks uh, in the riparian poplar forest. It's also very common in uh, uh, shelter belts at farms in southern Alberta with mature trees. Um, uh, and they uh, ex uh, feed exclusively on insects. And you can see them sitting on a a wire or a branch like that and fly up and take uh, uh, insects all the time. The other really common one, again, this is extremely nondescript. Uh, there's about five species of uh, flycatchers known as impidnax. Um, this is the least flycatcher and very, very common in uh, these uh, repop repairing poplar forests. Um, you can tell them that the best way to identify them is by their call, which is Quebec, Quebec. And if you're walking through the forest, you've got your ears tuned to that, you hear it all over the place. And it can be in some areas and some habitats, the most common bird. So um, that's one to be on the lookout. Two other species of, these are flycatchers again, are kingbirds. These are both about the size of the robins and um, they can be very aggressive. Um, also very common in farmyard shelter belts. The Western King uh, bird has that gray head, that yellow breast, and sort of a black tail. An Eastern King has the white underparts, white tip on the tail, and black, um, um, black on the uh, back. I'm sorry, I've got that mixed up there. The, the well, Eastern King bird is the bird at the top with the white breast. The Western King bird is the uh, bird at the bottom with the yellow breast. My apologies for the mislabeling with that. Um, Again, these are fun to watch, uh, a pair of them, because they're very aggressive. A crow flies by or something like that, and they, they pursue it uh, madly. So uh, very protective of their nests. And also very uh, easy to photograph and things like that. Another bird that's extremely common, um, and you hear it singing from the high treetops, and that's the red-eyed vireo. Um, this is a little bird. Um, when you do see it, that red eye is very distinctive, but they sit up on the top of a tree and they don't shut up. And you've got this call that is somewhat Robin-like, but it goes on for two minutes. So it's sort of like, here I am, look at me, look up. And it goes on for two minutes. And if you're out doing bird surveys all day long and um, you just want to kind of tell them to shut up because you guys just, talk too much. So, but again, a very, very common bird and uh, the high, high, high tree tops in these forests. Another one I'm sure everybody's familiar with, uh, black captivity, um, common at feeders, but also very common in natural areas. Now, this brings me to another one. I've sort of um, abandoned some photos here simply to, to just show you what we've got. There are five species of swallows that if we were to sit um, at a spot on the riverbank for 20 minutes today, we'd get all five of them. If we had done that um, three weeks ago, uh, well, we might even get a, a sixth one today too, but there's another one that we could also get called a violet green. These are four of those spare uh, swallows and they all um, sort of have a reliance on the, the river because of um, insect blooms and things like that. Um, bank swallow, um, nests and cut banks. They'll actually go in and dig out cut banks and use former holes uh, along the river and they nest in colonies, you know, up to several hundred pairs. Northern rough wings will actually nest in nests and um, uh, are more lone birds rather than colonial. Tree swallows are dependent on um, holes in trees 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, starlings, um, but they are dependent on, on the cavities in these trees, small cavities, and are very common in the riparian poplar forest. Barn swallows uh, again make their own nests. Um, they can make them on the side of buildings, under bridges, um, but all four of those will fly along the river to catch insects. And um, if we were to keep track, we would see several hundred swallows today flying along the river. This is the fifth species. This is a cliff swallow. And this swallow um, typically is associated with bridges. Um, and they nest on the side of bridges along rivers. And uh, again, very common. Um, at this time of the year, if you have um, outbreaks of uh, insects, I know at Frank Lake, for example, I can have all five of these species and probably have um, at least tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of species flying a, a foot above the lake um, at this time of the lake, they, uh, at this time of the year during a windy and rainy kind of day. So um, a very big part of the bird fauna of these areas. Hey Greg, we, yeah, <laughs> we have a few questions. Um, one person is wondering, has the declining insect population affected bird populations? Very much so. Um, the barn swallow that I showed you, in particular these swallows, barn swallow and bank swallow, and I, I'm astonished to say this as a birder, because they're both very common birds, are now listed as endangered species. I don't, I can't remember, it's, I think it's threatened under the species at risk, the Federal Species at Risk Act. So they have become um, threatened and it's because of uh, changes in insect populations. Um, and there's a whole host of birds. The, the other one, um, one that would migrate through here is the yellow-sided flycatcher. And again, its numbers have diminished. A lot of the shorebirds, particularly the Arctic breeding shorebirds, have declined in numbers. Um, we're trying to figure that one out, but it's obviously related to climate change. So a lot of these insect dependent birds. One bird I didn't show here is a common nighthawk, which um, again feeds extensively on insects and used to be much more common. It used to fly over High River when I was a kid. Don't see them anymore. Um, so it really, a lot of these insect, insectivorous birds are really showing bad signs of decline. For me to sit here and tell you that barn swallows are on an, uh, uh, an endangered species list, I, I would never have dreamed of that 10 years ago. So I have a question about that then. Is some of that due to habitat loss as well? And is there anything that we can do in our own yards to encourage insects, you know, to, to grow and to thrive so that there is more food for birds? Um, some of it, for these insectivorous birds, um, habitat loss probably plays a role in some of this, but in a lot of these, I think it's, what we're finding is it's more related to the timing of hatches. So all this stuff, a lot of the energetics of these birds is finely tuned, particularly Arctic nesting birds, whereas you've got a small window to get up there, have your kids, and have them put on enough fat, and you put on enough fat so you can fly south. So if the timing's off, so if climate change has changed the time you arrive versus the time of hatch, hatching of insects, um, and you can't put on enough fat, fat, you're going to decline. So I think the question, the answer to that question is, in terms of these insectivorous birds, probably not. In terms of other birds, Absolutely. Okay. Um, eat, if you want to protect uh, prairie birds, eat grass-fed beef. Good to know. So th are you saying then the insect populations have gone down due to climate change? They've gone down and they've also changed their chronology. Okay. And we don't know, there has been um, declines in species, species abundance, but it's also just related in terms of, say, mosquito outbreaks. So the mosquitoes um, typically, on average, would hatch um, May 1st, and now they're hatching April 20th. Oh, okay. Um, that's had a big impact. 
Okay, uh, we have one more question about tree swallows. Now we have some nesting boxes for them up in our dog park at the mm -hmm. top of the escarpment and someone's wondering, is it common that tree swallows would actually use these nesting boxes? Yes, very common. Um, in fact, if you go west, there's a lot of um, mountain bluebird trails set up and to avoid uh, competition between mountain bluebirds and tree swallows, because they'll both use the same box, what they do is they put boxes close together, like uh, adjacent fence posts, because mountain bluebirds won't nest next to one another, and really close next to one another, and tree swallows won't nest really close next to one another. So if you have two boxes, tree swallow will use one, a mountain bluebird will use another. Um, I know at, at like Frank Lake, we have dozens of boxes up and they're all used regularly. The only thing I would say in terms of in town is that you, if you put them up, for example, in your backyard, um, it's possible you could get a tree swallow, but unfortunately house sparrows come in and tend to use them. So in, in urban areas, uh, suburban areas like Oak Tokes, you need to have them far enough away from houses uh, and development. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really know where the dog park is in town. And I think it's a good idea that the tree swallow boxes are up there, but um, you wouldn't want to um, put them up all over town. I think it was a task when one city in, in up by Edmonton um, had a really nice idea to put up all these um, swallow boxes in town and they all got taken over by house sparrows quite rapidly. So, um, I would just caution people that if you've got an acreage or something, put them on a fence post, um, put them about 50 feet away from trees. Good to know. And Greg, it is 8.05. So is there anything else that you really wanted to cover this evening? Um, I've got probably another dozen slides that people would like to, um, I mean, having me show them, that's fine. I can quit now. Um, <clears throat> I hope, if nothing else, Jenny, I just um, showing people that there are a lot of really neat things that you can see and just walking along the river and taking note of these birds. Um, they're there, they're easy to find. Um, these apps that you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. the one thing that it just became difficult to do here is if you can learn the songs, I guess if I had to lose a sense as a birder, I don't know whether I'd give up my sense of sound or my sense of seeing simply because I uh, identify as many birds by sight as I do by sound. Um, and if you can cue into that. The other thing is, if you cue into sounds, even if you don't know what it is, you know that a bird is making that sound and so walk towards it and see what it is. So if people oh. would like me to proceed, I can finish up with what yeah, I Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea. Um, let's just keep going. I do have one question though that was, uh, from back when we were talking about the belted kingfisher. Um, someone was asking, um, what exactly is a cut bank? A cut bank would just be um, a dirt bank along a river that's uh, vertical. Awesome, okay, and then we have another question. Are there still blue jays in Okotoks? Oh yeah, tons of blue jays in Okotoks. And I would concur. Um, they will, <laughs> at this time of the year though, um, they are just finishing up nesting, and there is a period of time where they just shut up where they're tending to their young, they don't want to draw attention to themselves, and that's probably why you're not hearing as many. Um, you have to watch, I know at my feeders, they're coming really early in the morning um, now, and you don't see them the rest of the day, and um, they haven't disappeared, they're just being quiet to take care of the kids. Awesome, okay, I have no more questions, so you continue on. Okay. Um, this is another, this bird actually, white-breasted nuthatch, uh, I started about 50 years ago doing all of this now. And if you go back to the old versions of the bird of Alberta, um, Salt and Wilk uh, declared this to be a very rare bird in Alberta. So I don't know why it expanded its range, but it did. It may have it had to do with the fact that these riparian poplar forests um, have all gotten older since the 1963 flood and provide habitat for the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, they're very common. You can hear this gronk, gronk, gronk call as you walk through. Many of you have feeders are probably familiar with them. The other thing that's really neat about the, the white-breasted nuthatch is they go head down trees. So they're a little different in that regard. That bird's about the size of a chickadee. 
Another one that is very, very common in the, the very public course, particularly where you've got willow thickets, um, is the house wren. And they make this chatty little call, very song if you're listening for them. Again, if we were walking along the River Valley, we'd probably encounter 20 of these easily today. One, one, if you go through a lot of biodiversity literature, one of the reasons a lot of species are declining is because of the introduction of non-native species. This bird, European starling, is responsible for the decline of a lot of species. I mentioned tree um, swallows nesting in holes in cottonwoods. Um, if you go in there, now European starlings are one of the most common birds and they are using the holes in the trees to nest in. The tree swallows therefore have to pick a size of hole that is small enough to let them get in. You also had somebody, you know, talking about nest boxes. Those have been set up for mountain bluebirds in particular, but also tree swallows, and they have a hole dimension that is too small for starlings. The species was introduced to North America by some Shakespeare nuts enthusiasts who wanted to introduce every bird mentioned in Shakespeare's uh, plays in Central Park in New York. Since that time, this species has had detrimental effects on our native bird populations. Um, so just something to bear in mind when we introduce new things. But actually, it can be a very pretty bird, and this is probably the most common bird in a riparian poplar course. This is another one, um, <laughs> kind of neat. Uh, it's called a gray catbird. And the reason it's a catbird is it meows like a cat. Um, it can be quite secretive. It likes to um, hide in willow thickets. Um, and a uh, very pretty bird, actually. It's gray with a black cap and it's got the uh, uh, red bottom, as you can see there. And um, you have to watch for it, but if you hear something sounds like a cat meowing in the trees, it could be this bird. This one, of course, is everybody knows, the American robin, uh, very common in uh, habitats and also around yards and stuff. This particular bird is a male. And the reason I know that is the rich, dark black head. Females have a brown head, um, so you can watch for that. Um, and yeah, high densities of this species in riparian public forest. So Greg, we have a question about the starlings. Um, so someone is wondering, are the European starlings the ones that swarm around in the country? So when we see giant swarms of birds, you know, ma magically moving around in the air in a big swarm or flock, is are those starlings or are they something yeah, else? Those are the starlings. So when I, I, murma, murma, murmification, is that what it's called? Murma something or murmur, murmification I think is the word of it. And it's, yeah, that's truly spectacular to watch it. And you can see that um, at several locations around on migration, you see that quite frequently. Great. And yeah, it's, it's spectacular to watch. So um, this is a bird that we have, there's two types of wax wings. And for anybody who's a birder, in the wintertime, we have bohemian wax wings. And in the summertime, we have cedar wax wings. The cedar wax wings migrate south. The bohemian wax wings migrate south from the boreal forests and from the mountains. The big way to tell them apart, and I always do this, I run the High River Christmas bird count. You really can't see it on this one. Well, you can see it on this one. If that were a bohemian waxwing, it'd have a brown bum. And that's the way you tell them apart. But this is a very uh, common bird that you will get in the or along the creeks in um, uh, Okotoks. Very pretty um, and usually occur in, in small flocks. This is. I call it the potato chip bird. This is the American goldfinch. They're showing up now. For me, um, the thing about uh, American goldfinches is that my mom has this beautiful crab apple tree in her backyard with white blossoms. And the crab apple blossoms every year, and you get the white blossoms with about uh, 15 or 20 American goldfinches sitting on the tree, and it's truly spectacular. Um, when they fly, they'll give a call potato chip, potato chip. So that's distinctive. Um, when I used to tell that, show it to my niece when she was five, she thought it was, that was pretty cool. When she's a little older now, she just thinks her, her uncle's a little crazy. But um, a very beautiful bird. That's a bird that you can commonly get at feeders. Um, you wanna get a finch feeder and set it up, put Niger in the feeder, canola in the feeder, but what works best is crushed sunflower seeds. 
In fact, if you have crushed sunflower seeds, the um, niger and canola will be discarded on the ground, but um, you'll certainly be rewarded uh, with a bird like this. Gorgeous. Um, I skipped a group here, it just dawned on me um, about blackbirds. And I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with red winged blackbirds and, and, um, and grackles and things like that. The one in there that I really wanted to show though, which is very common, is uh, the Baltimore Oriole. And they nest very high up in trees and they make this hanging nest basket that they nest in. And my apologies for not having it there. If you have a field guide or just want to look on uh, the internet, um, look for um, Baltimore Oriole. Uh, they get this beautiful Peter, Peter, Peter call. And if you hear that and you get used to it, you can identify them quite easily. The other thing, if you live in an older part of town where they've got mature trees, if you take an orange or a grapefruit and you uh, somehow secure it, say, to a, a, a post, you can put, a, put it through a dowel on a post or put some nails on top of the post and squish the orange or grapefruit on that, and you put some grape jelly on it. And I am told by aficionados that it has to be Welch's grape jelly. I'm not getting any kickback from Welch's. Um, you can have um, Baltimore Orioles come in and feed on that, and you'll get great opportunities to get pictures of just one of the most brilliantly colored birds there is out there. Um, a few years back, I got a call from a friend of mine, and he and his wife were sitting on the deck, and they were drinking some sort of fruity drink, drink with fruit in it. And all of a sudden this Baltimore rail came and landed on the railing next to him and he, he took a picture of it and asked me what it was. And I told him, I, I asked him what he was drinking. And he said, well, we have this, these drinks with all this fruit in it. And that's what brought it in was this. But try that trick um, if you live near tall trees, old tall trees, and you'll be rewarded with uh, Baltimore rails. So the other group of birds in, in, in that are common, and there's a lot of species. Again, uh, right now you could probably get up to 15 species of sparrows moving through, uh, depending on how well you know your birds and how intently you bird. There's a few common breeding species though. Chipping sparrows um, have that bright red crown and the, the white line over their eye, and they sing higher from the uh, uh, treetops and they give sort of a trilling call. Clay-colored sparrow is really also common and it nests in shrubby areas. It's got the gray um, behind the neck and they have a, a three note buzz, buzz, buzz call. And uh, you can find them quite easily. Two others that are very common. Song sparrow is um, a bird I just always uh, associate with the river valleys uh, in Southern Alberta and they nest right along um, in, in, in trees or they sing from trees, shrubs, right along the water's edge. And that's a song sparrow. And the name is not a misnomer. It has a beautiful song to it. One thing about it is it's a bit of a chunky bird and that um, dark spot, if you look in the middle of it, of uh, the breast there is often very prominent. The other one that's more restricted to grassy areas. So you'd have to have sort of a larger grassy open in um, a, a field uh, in the middle of or adjacent to a poplar forest's savanna sparrow and they can be told by that yellow streak over the eye. Two of the common, um, there's a lot of species migrating through the area, but two birds that white crown sparrows possibly nest in the area, but probably not. Um, but the white crown sparrow, the bird at the top, uh, has those three white stripes on its head and it's moving through on mass right now if you have a feeder or even in your yard if you've got shrubs and that you'll probably see it and very similar to it is the white-throated sparrow um, it has that white throat underneath um, and they always sing they've got this wonderful song oh canada 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 um, it's always a, a great sign of spring to me so those are just two of the types of species that are, are migrating through and very spectacular, very pretty birds, and easy to see. Another one that is a little more nondescript, but um, also comes through in big enough numbers, is Lincoln Sparrow. 
And uh, again, it's one that people should be on the lookout for. It's got this buffy um, sort of uh, breast with fine streaks. If you go back and look at the song sparrow, it had six streaks. These are fine streaks. So that's the Lincoln Sparrow. Finally, um, we'll get to the warblers. Um, this is the one bird that is going to be breeding um, in the area for warblers. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that many warblers uh, breeding in southern Alberta, but the yellow warbler does. Um, fairly common bird, very beautiful. That's the male, it's got some red streaking on the breast. Beautiful little song um, and just a great little bird. And uh, you'll find it in sort of uh, low deciduous uh, shrubs and um, younger uh, balsam poplar, aspen poplar. Um, so be on the lookout for that, but it's just a gorgeous little bird. And in terms of the warblers, right now there are again about uh, 20 species moving through the area. And uh, if we were going through, we could probably see any one of those on any given day. But um, Calgary, you really have to work to get uh, migrating warblers in Calgary, it seems. But these two, you don't. The yellow rumped warbler um, is very common, been moving through for about the last three weeks, as has the orange crowned. Uh, the yellow rumps are blue, are, are brilliant color. They've got the yellow uh, on the, the back of the upper tail. And, uh, the orange crow. Jenny, I think I'm done. If people wanted to talk about apps, <laughs> we can Okay, I've got no more questions for now. Um, yeah, so I think we might be good to go, unless anyone has any last questions they want to type in there. Well, so far, so good. Um, if you do have anything, you can always email uh, me at sustainability at okotoks.ca. Uh, Colin is wondering, field guides, what do you recommend? Um, I would recommend two, um, the Sibley guide and uh, the Peterson guide. Sibley would be my number one choice. Peterson would be number two. Um, they all come with books, but the advantage of having the phone guides is that they all have um, recordings of the bird songs. And I'm, as I say for me, birds by sound as I do by sight, and those recordings can really help you learn those. The other one that's free, those two are about $20 a piece, is the Audubon Field Guide. I don't like it as much as the other two. The other two use um, drawings to depict their birds, paintings of birds, which makes it easier for them to show the features. With a photograph, sometimes you Get the lighting isn't right and you miss a prominent feature or, or, or something like that. Audubon has lots of pictures but what Audubon has that the other two don't is it has extensive life history, range, um, feeding, nest, egg description information. Uh, so I think it's great and the fact it's free it's good. Um, but Sibley is the one I guess I would be my go-to app and I would highly recommend it. So that's all we have for now. So I will cut us off here and just say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And thank you so much, Greg, for a great presentation. I always learn so much from you every time. Um, and before anyone goes away, I want to let you all know that Environment Week is coming up next week from May 31st to June the 6th. So on the 31st at 1 p.m., I'll be hosting a webinar with uh, Calgary Wildlife, where we're going to be talking about some of the more understood and kind of funky animals in the area, such as skunks, bats, porcupines and magpies. Then on the 4th, Alexandria Farmer, our wonderful local uh, native bee expert, uh, she will be talking about native bees uh, in our webinar. And she's always so funny and so interesting. So that's going to be great. Then on the 6th, we are going to be hosting a virtual repair cafe. This should be interesting. It's our first time doing this. So if you have anything that needs fixing, you can fill out a participation form at okotokes.ca slash repair cafe and try and get a spot at the cafe and read up on all our funky details for how this virtual event is going to take place. So again, big thanks to Greg for all of this wonderful information on birds in our river valley. I'm excited to go for a bike ride there tomorrow and see what I see. And thank you all of you for joining us tonight. So stay safe. Stay healthy and everyone take care.